But it's a great honor to be, but it's a great honor to be with Mr. John John. I call him the San Fran Reverend. Hallelujah. I like his attire with his skinny jeans and his beautiful wife and beautiful kids. I knew the kids before they were kids. Amen. I knew them before they had children. Just, and uh, I've seen the hand of God upon him. And, you know, to make it in this city, not everyone can. Because it's a unique city. And I lived for years in Amsterdam, Holland, before I knew the Lord. And it reminds me very much of Amsterdam, both pro and con. Amster Amsterdam has over 100, and, uh, over 100 nationalities. And when you have a place like that, either you know how to ad adapt and fit in or you get wiped out by the crosswinds. But I, I thank the Lord God has a plan for San Francisco. And, you know, he, he's, he, John John was nice the way he introduced me here today. But nice introduction, amen? Sure hope God shows up after that. But anyhow, um, I first wanted nothing to do with this city. He kept after me until I said, I yes. Then I said, well, pick me up. And then he showed up at my house. And I got about 20 minutes from here, and I felt all those demonic powers that have had such a sway in this place. And then I said, we better pray. And I remember God took m my heart out for San Francisco and gave me his. So I stand here with the heart of God for San Francisco, not because I asked for it. I didn't ask for it. <laughs> but ready or not, here God came because I'd had a family member destroyed by some of the spirits that work in the city. And I'd kept that. I didn't realize I'd kept that in me. And God gave me his heart for San Francisco. And right after then, it was amazing. All these New Agers and uh, people in all type of sexual perversion started coming to me and wanting help. You see, when you have God's heart, it's going to open doors. I said, when you have God's heart, it's going to open doors. And I thank God for his heart for San Francisco because I believe there's a massive visitation coming to this city. And God's going to do something very incredible because that's what God's all about. He, you know, you don't have to go, I did go to the mission field, but you don't have to go to the mission field if you live in San Francisco. This is the mission field. And the world is here. And the church needs to learn how to relate. Amen? Not, re, not repel, but relate to this precious mission field. And so it's an honor to be here today. And... Uh, John John and the First Lady and I are going to go fly the friendly skies Monday. Another place I'd say I don't like going is to the south of the United States. But there I go. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, I've learned to watch where you say you don't want to go because guess what? <laughs> well, it, yeah, right. Someone, someone just had a lion spirit jump on them. <laughs> All right. We want to go to the... Word of the Lord here today, Isaiah 61. My family was from Mississippi, so I, I know the southern flavor. Thank you, Jesus. Huh? No wonder I'm in California. <laughs> if you're interested in any of my messages uh, that are digitalized, how's that for saying it right? You can go to Bill Norton GHS, that's BillNortonGHS.com. We've got all my messages, or a lot of my messages, in digital form. And uh, I didn't even know what that meant. That's why I stay out of technology. My son says, stay in my dominion. If I touch computers, they, they don't love me ever after. But, but uh, we have all our messages, BillNortonGHS.com. You can look them up, buy them, it goes towards missions work as well, and also things in the foyer. All right. We want to go to Isaiah 61, and uh, we, we, we want to see the message that, that almost got Jesus killed, his first message. Hopefully there'll be no reaction like that here today. Hallelujah. But he was back in his hometown, a place called Nazareth, and they, they gave him this, the scroll, like it was their holy writings, their Bible, the Old Covenant, and he opened right to here and read it. And let's, since Jesus read it, let's read it. It says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. What makes Christianity Christianity? It's not a, one of the world's great religions. It's not a religion at all. It's God came among men in a supernatural way to reveal himself by the anointing. 
And the anointing is none other than the power of God's Spirit upon individuals to change them and transform them. And so Jesus came as the anointed one. He didn't come as a philosopher. He didn't come as a prophet. didn't come as a good old boy. He didn't come as a bad old boy. He came as the anointed one. He came as the Christ. And may I say this, regardless what need I have, and I have needs, or you have, you have needs, in the anointing, they can be met. Amen? And the anointing, the scripture says, can break every yoke. Amen? Thank God for the anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ coming among men. And then it says this, he sent me to bring good tidings to the meek. The gospel's good news. I said the gospel's good news. And it goes on and says this, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captain, the open, oh, captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Regardless how much inner damage is in my life or your life, in the good news of Christ, it can be resolved. I said it can be resolved. It can be mightily resolved. I work in Cambodia, and oh my goodness, if you wanted to see a destroyed populace, when we went there initially, cops were, were, had rocket-propelled grenades. You don't want to cross them. I had a friend, he said he saw someone do a traffic violation, and the cop was aiming the grenade right at him. Help us, Jesus. Little kids had AK-47s. When people would see God do miracles, all they could do is cry because they saw their parents killed before their eyes. But I want to thank God less than 20 years later, over in, in the network I'm a part of, over a million new conversions occurred because by the anointing, God comes to heal the broken heart. By the anointing, God comes to restore everything Satan has stolen. There's good news. Are you glad there's good news for San Francisco today? And there's good news for your life today. And there's good news for my life today. Marquise, give me water, please, sir. I don't like dry preaching. But anyhow, here was the Lord opening these scriptures that the Jews had had for, for centuries. Please open the door. Yeah, that'll do. Isn't this a good man? We've had good times here. Give me the, give me the cap. He came to my home with, with your pastor, and my dogs didn't attack either of them. I found they're good. I let them in. Amen. Just joking, kind of. But anyhow, where am I? Oh, the good news. <laughs> you see, not only was Jesus reading this, he was this. He's the healer of the broken heart. He's the restorer of lives that are powerless, putrid, absolutely perverted, because the anointing can break every satanic bondage on the face of the earth. We were in the nation of Bhutan near Tibet, and the spiritual attack was just off the, the chart. I had one guy was there. He couldn't leave the room for three days. It took him weeks to recover. And so in an area where there, were, there was one handful of believers, no churches, were facing some great challenges. But in the, the next morning, my friend, who's very much a seer in, in, as an intercessor, he woke up laughing, and I said, what's going on? He said, last night, uh, some of these satanic priests in this area tried to astral project in our room, but I put the blood over this balcony, and they couldn't come in. I said they couldn't come in. There's authority. There's authority in the anointed one. There's authority to change and reverse everything because, dear ones, there's a natural world we can see. There's a spiritual world, except God opens our spiritual eyes we can't see, but the spiritual world controls the natural world. And it's amazing in world countries this in North America, we think we're too big to understand this, but the spiritual dimension, hallelujah, Jesus came to give us the keys over hell and death. The good news, the good news is not just in printed form, it's in a personalized form called the Son of God. Yeah. And so he said that whatever prison you're in, whatever captivity you have, I'm anointed to change that. When God raises up a ministry and puts his anointing on it, it's to change the place and the people in that place. 
Then, then it goes on and says this, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. And notice this, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes. I want to talk about beauty for ashes. The reason I talk about this, I was waiting on the Lord this year. I was reading, I wish I hadn't, but I was reading some of these things so-called prophets said was going to happen this year, which isn't going to happen. I knew it was flesh talking. And I waited on God because I start in January in Arkansas. And I um, almost think I need a translator, Jonathan. But anyhow, I show up there and I enjoy those people. I've been going there 20 years. And they make fun of the way I talk. I make fun of the way they talk, so we have a fun time. And uh, I need prayer because, man, everything is fried. And I feel fried by the time I leave there. But, 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 but when I was... Waiting on God, I said, Lord, what is the word for this year? What do you have to tell your body? Though I preach a number of things. Out of my innermost being came this word, beauty for ashes. And I want to relate that to all our lives because here's the revelation God gave me as I started to preach this. The gospel is not just for the unbeliever. That's where we've messed up. The gospel is really for the believer. Yes, it forgives the unbeliever and makes them a believer, but then the gospel is applicable to all our lives. Hear me. To your past, to your present, and to your future, there's good news. It's not good news. It wants to make it good news. Beauty for ashes. I said beauty for ashes. Let's repeat that. Beauty for ashes. Not ashes for beauty. Beauty for ashes. If the gospel can't reverse the curse, it's not the gospel. If the gospel can't turn your mess into a masterpiece, it's not the gospel. If the gospel can't take a nobody and make them a somebody, it's not the gospel. Now, it's very important in North America right now, we get gospel-focused and gospel-centered because unbelieving people want to make us think like they want to think. And if I didn't have a a Savior, I'd think like they're thinking. Everything is negative outside of Christ. And if they are positive, it's really an optimism based on sand. Unfortunately, I was educated in Europe. And the European philosophers, existentialists, if you don't know what that means, that doesn't matter because they don't know what it means. But anyhow, uh, the European existentialists taught this. Life is meaningless because life ends at the grave. Real good news, huh? (laughs) Would you pass out the guns, please, to blow your brains out? See, if they really believe that, and then they think they have answers for humanity, that's a deception beyond deception. Because outside of the gospel, there is no good news. But in Christ, there is good news. And God loves to turn a mess into a masterpiece. God loves to turn a dark place into a place of glory. God loves to turn around the impossible with the miraculous. I tell you, my God is the God of good news because my God is good news. Now, religion, let me hear that word. That ain't good news because that's man generally messing with the gospel. You can't do this, and you can't go here, and you can't do this, and you can't do this. And I'm glad I've been delivered from religion. I was delivered from sin, but I'm glad religious stuff. Like years ago in northern New York, there was this particular pastor. He was a couple hundred miles away from his church, and someone saw him. And they said, what are you doing here? He said, in my community, I can't go to a movie. Everybody will be talking about me. So he came 200 miles to go to a movie. May, May I say that? That's just not dumb. That's dumb and dumber. That has nothing to do with the gospel. Where does that, cra- where did that crazy stuff ever start? And so re- religion is not good news. And hear me, the enemy wants people to get out of the gospel into religiosity and into judgmentalism because if anyone could have judged any of us, Christ could have. But he bore the judgment. Are you glad our Savior took the judgment that we deserve? And I deserve damnation, and I deserve separation, and I deserve condemnation, but I can't. 
That's why when he made these proclamations and he said, today this is being fulfilled in your ears, they didn't take it kindly because he, he then gave some illustrations that rebuked their unbelief and pre previous generations' unbelief. But, but those that will hear and heed the good news will experience supernatural transformation. Oh, hallelujah. And, and, and God's not, hear me, overwhelmed by people's sins because he already took care of it on the cross. But it's the unbelief, choosing not to believe. Oh, hallelujah. And when people refuse the gospel, the Bible talks about professing to become wise, be wise, they become fools. Their, their foolish minds were darkened. And there's only darkness outside of the gospel. But in the gospel, there's all the promises of God. And today we want to emphasize a little bit. Go to Psalm 105, please. Psalm 105, verse 17. Beauty for ashes. I want to stay there because I'm excited about the gospel. Even if it almost got Christ killed when he proclaimed it. Imagine this. His hometown that knew him his whole life in the flesh... When he, when he rebuked them for their unbelief by giving some illustrations about Elijah didn't go to an Israeli widow, he went to a heathen widow because da-da-da-da-da. And they didn't take it kindly because he was cutting through all their self-righteousness and all their religiousness and pointing them to the only one who could bring redemption. Because I'll, I'll tell you this, regardless what you're in today, redemption means bringing you out of bondage. And then there comes a thing called restoration, God taking you where you should have been or where you never could have been. I'm glad our God redeems, I'm gl glad our God restores. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. And then he also revives. The gospel just doesn't bring forgiveness. I preach the gospel. All these people got saved. True. But that's just the beginning of the good news, not the end of the good news. And a guy told me it was in the south where we're headed tomorrow, of all things, or Monday. Yeah, tomorrow. He, that's what happens when you get older. But anyhow, he told me this. He said, we have a lot of grace for sinners, but we don't have any grace after we're saved. May I say this? The grace God gives you after salvation is the continuation and the magnification of what you got when you called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, may grace abound. May true grace abound. May the good news break forth. Because my God gives beauty for ashes. Psalm 105, verse 17, it says, He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a slave. They, his feet was hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him, and may I say, fried him and crucified him. Yes. If we had time, we could go to the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, and lay all this out. But when I was waiting on the Lord for today what to share, I want to sh state that the gospel is able to penetrate any area of our life, past, present, or future, and give us beauty for ashes. First thing about Joseph that got him in trouble, he was favored and he, his father gave him a mantle and he had trust upon him. And may I say this, God, even before people are saved, before people know the beginnings of the gospel, has a destiny and has spirituality to bestow on them. And that's why I like to say this, God is a recycler. He takes the trash of your past puts it through the cross, and turns it into treasures. Say, so you don't know the trash. Put it through the cross. It will turn into treasures. And a lot, of th a lot of times what you were doing before you knew the Lord was just your future in a twisted way. For example, my father was a CEO of a corporation, and I would go in and drive him crazy. What are you going to do with your life? You know what I told him? This was a 15-year-old smart, I won't use the other term, smart mouth kid. And I would, I would yell back, I'm going to travel. <laughs> well, that's true, but not for what I was traveling for then. Smoke and joke and everything else. I'm not, I know, I'm out of that. 
but it was in me to travel. And there's things in you, the reason it can't go anywhere safely yet, it's got to go through the cross. I said it's got to go through the cross or it stays trash. When it goes through the cross, it turns into treasures. Oh, hallelujah. My God's the great trash collector. He gets rid of the junk and brings the glory. Oh, hallelujah. And so here was Joseph. The book of Genesis said his father made him a special coat. And that coat was going to get him in trouble because his brothers got jealous that he had something they didn't have. And a unique thing, when I did some research years ago, or a friend of mine didn't gave me the facts, he said this, those, the coat he had was not a normal coat because they were shepherds, because they had short sleeve because they'd be messing with animals and everything else. The coat that Joseph had that day, the mantle that he was wearing, was long sleeve. It was only worn by princes and world leaders. May I say this, there's a lot of unreleased mantles and potential that, that at, at the moment it looks like it can never happen, but there's, there's something buried in you God wants to bring forth. And may I say this, here's the thing about the gospel. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, unto good works, which God has before ordained that we'd walk in. There's things God has ordained for you. There's things God's ordained for you. And the gospel preordains you to things you could never produce in yourself. Yeah. I'm afraid if I, serve out to, if I sell out to God, he won't let me go to here, there, anywhere. Hear me. If you don't sell out to God, you'll never go where you're supposed to go. You will be on dead end streets and detours. I was with a man. He built this huge resort in upstate New York. But by the time he was 60 years old, had a heart attack. And I looked at him and I said, Bruce, did you build all this because you rejected the call of God on your life to be a pastor? And he's a friend of mine. He dropped his head and he said, yes, Bill, I think I did. Why would you want to build something that's less than the mantle of many colors that God has for you? Why would you settle for second best and second hand when you're an original that God has a supernatural plan for and he wants to bring you out of every pain and every loss? He wants to give you beauty for ashes because when Joseph's brethren withstood who he was meant to be, it was going to be some severe suffering. The Bible says when they, his father sent him on a mission and they saw him coming and they grabbed him and stripped off his coat and threw him in a pit. I like this one. Pit, P-I-T, prophet in training. <laughs> Prime minister in training. If I was God, I sure wouldn't train some of the people the way he trained people to get where they're supposed to get. Moses, backside of a wilderness for 40 years. Here was Joseph, betrayed by his brethren. And betrayal is deep, particularly when it's by those closest to you. And some people choose to never get over it. They threw him in a pit and then sold him into slavery. And he ended up in Egypt. You'd say, wait a minute, that's the last place you want to go. That's where your grandfather got in trouble. That's the last place you want to go. It typifies the world. That's the last place you want to go. But hear me, over all of this, the injustice, the betrayal, the thievery, over all of it, there were higher hands direct in his life to where God wanted him to go. And look, the betrayal and the injustice and the woundedness, God was going to give him beauty for ashes because that wasn't where he was going to live indefinitely. And dear ones, we got to hear this in North America and you dwelling in San Francisco and in other places need to become a voice of the gospel. You know, the devil wants people, yeah, I, I grew up this way and my mama did and my father did this and I don't have education and I'm the wrong race with no grace. Now, if we listen to the voice of false prophets, we'll buy into those lies. How many hear what I'm saying? But I'm not going to buy into no lie. 
I want the gospel. I want the good news for my life and for my children. And I'm not going to see the continuation of pain and betrayal and injustice. We've got to know that the, the answers for humanity are not in the hands of the ungodly. They're in the hands of the saints because the answers that are needed are not economic or emotional or psychological. They're spiritual. And if you get the spiritual right, everything else follows. The gospel is not meant to stay in church. The gospel is meant to rule the earth. Joseph, how do you like being a slave down there in Egypt? And where's that nice coat? I mean, the mocking voices of the devil. And hear me, the enemy mocks you concerning who you are and where you think you're going to go in life. And that's why you need to turn the tables on him and just say, hang around a while and see. I'm going to go where God wants me to go because hear me, if you take go out of the gospel, all you got is a spell. I'm not going to live in no spell. I'm going to go where God wants me to go and I'm going to flow where God wants me to flow. I'm going to grow like God wants me to grow. But if anything could have gone wrong, it was going wrong in Joseph's life. It looked humanly impossible for him to become what he was supposed to become. And like Everything burned up, there was ashes. But the gospel, beauty for ashes, beauty for ashes. It's easy to preach this, but when you face loved ones or you face personal circumstances or you face societal circumstances and wickedness and sin, and it looks like things are in the hands of man or the hands of the enemy at times, but I've got better news for you. I've got good news for you. i got the gospel. Things are in the hands of God. And he's working to reverse the curse. He's working to undo the plan of the enemy. And only God can do this, use the plan of the enemy, turn around the plan of the enemy, and then discard the plan of the enemy. That's the gospel, dear friends. You say, well, where's grace? You need grace to go through the process. Because the gospel, it's the power of God to salvation, and salvation is progressive. Hear me. If you know the gospel and understand it, you can go look at some drug addict and say, I see that man become a mighty evangelist. You can look in someone, they don't know if they're male, female, or whatever. You can tell them you can be healed and find your true identity because you are not a secondary person. You're not a secondhand person. You're not some fake or so phony. You're an original person called by the call of God and the blood of Jesus can make you new. You see, the gospel is the answer to all the woes of humanity. And it has inertia. It has go in it. That's why when Jesus gave them the last admonition, he said, go ye. And you can't take the go out of gospel. Uh, I've had people tell me, imagine this, John, John. Well, you going to the nations and traveling, that's your call. But we just feel led to stay here. I said, you feel led all right, L-E-A-D, L-E-A-D. Or you need to, one of the... No, we're all called to impact the earth, to impact the nations. It's the Abrahamic covenant out of which the the gospel demonstrates the power and the glory of the risen Christ. Beauty for ashes. Here is Joseph in slavery in Egypt. He, he, He hadn't gone to any school for business training or anything else, but you know, the guy that bought it was the guy in charge of Potiphar's prison system, a captain, and he saw Joseph when he was just hanging around the home, God only knows what he's doing, a slave, he saw this, that the Lord was with him. Now this is the reason I guarantee to any person, regardless what you've ever walked through, you can have beauty for ashes, is because the Lord's with you. And his redeeming plan, it doesn't happen as quick as I like. How many hear that? I wanted it yesterday. I wanted it last week. No, I wanted it 10 years ago. But the scriptures in the Psalm says, my times are in your hand. Well, I tried that and it didn't work for me as you've been on drugs for 20 years. I tried that for 20 minutes, you know, church. Come on, we got, we got to be real. It's not, there's overnight forgiveness. There's overnight miracles, but the process To get where you're supposed to be is not overnight. It's a journey from faith to faith and grace to grace and glory to glory. And the gospel truly gives us the inertia to fulfill our destiny, our journey in God. So here's Joseph. 
The Lord's with him. And Potiphar, the guy who bought him, Pharaoh's captain, made Joseph in charge because the Lord was with him. Everything he touched, he prospered. I can't get over how the Lord has released millions of dollars to me and I've never had a mailing list. I've never had con games. I mean, different ways of operating. I've never had to do some of these things that I believe have limited the gospel in certain people's testimony because when God calls you, there's a process and when you walk with him, he will prosper you. I said, he will prosper you. He will prosper you. Let me tell you, I don't care if you're broke, busted, and disgusted today. You walk with the Lord, learn his voice, walk into your gospel inheritance, you will prosper. I said, you will prosper. You will prosper. You will prosper. You will go from the ghetto to the get-go. You'll prosper. Without the help of man, you will prosper. When the Lord called me back to the nations, I grew up in Europe and then married my dear wife, came to the United States, and after years, I began to feel led to go back to Europe. And I, but I, I had three small kids. I didn't have any money. And I said, Lord, here's my tremendous worship service. It's nice you're calling me, but I can hardly pay my bills.